damn you for a stupid slut. That's for what you made me. Mother and daughter are slapping each other. Daughter Charlotte is subdominant because she's the most glamorous prostitute in London right now. And it was her mother, Margaret, who made her that way. Money is a woman's only power in this world. In 18th century London, prostitutes were popular. Everyone was in a state of pleasure and lust. Margaret ran a rudimentary brothel, but on this day, it was reported to the authorities. In court, the judge fined her 100 pounds. Margaret couldn't accept this and tried to explain that the girls were just her tenants. Then Charlotte arrived. No, oh, sir. My yeah. mother protects her girls because the law does not. Yeah. She is the exemplar of all the boards in London. Charlotte's plea confirmed Margaret's illegal behavior. Now Margaret had no reason to avoid the fine. Well, Charlotte was supposed to be able to help her mother pay the fine. After all, Charlotte was the most brilliant harlot in all of London, and Sir Howard liked her. If she signed his contract, she would have money for the rest of her life, but Charlotte refused to sell her freedom. So Margaret had to look to her youngest daughter, Lucy. Sell her virginity. Margaret's brothel was in crisis. Emily, the top prostitute, sensed danger and turned to Golden Square. There's just something about this high glass brothel. Shakespeare is being talked about here, and they're singing and playing instruments. Emily was shocked by the high class atmosphere. Emily met the brothel's owner, Lydia Quigley, and began to sell herself. When Lydia found out her current owner was Margaret, she immediately took Emily in, because Lydia and Margaret have been enemies for years. In order to keep Margaret down, Lydia hired a nun to report Margaret for a huge fine. Margaret had planned to upgrade her brothel and rent a building in Soho to relocate. But when she was reported, not only was she unable to pay the fine, she had problems paying the rent. She had to sell the virginity of her youngest daughter, Lucy. Lucy has always been well protected by her. Margaret puts her through school, plays the piano, writes poetry, and gives her the persona of a gentle lady. Tonight she is holding a secret auction for Lucy at the theater. Be a Wells woman. Firm free. The prostitutes and brothels of 18th century London are mesmerizing. The young, naive girl makes her debut tonight. Her mother gave her a pair of shiny shoes. Do you like them? They don't fit. They make them. At night, the opera house is filled with celebrities and spectators. Lucy slowly makes her way to the stage to be scrutinized. But young Lucy is a little nervous about being out in the world. She wept at the opera's most emotional moments. Her mother, Margaret, reminded her to keep her emotions in check and to keep looking beautiful at all times. But someone had already found them. Tears worked, you clever minx. Margaret had left for business. Lucy, however, is a little nervous. I'm not ready. It's not hard. You will learn to be the queen of pretend as I am. She's about to go down the same path her sister Charlotte did, but it was Charlotte's crazy fan who was the highest bidder for Lucy. Noble Sir Howard is not only devoted, he is also a jealous man. When he learns during the day that Charlotte has been flirting with someone else in his absence, he becomes jealous and decides to take revenge. We need the money. And take it. And so Lucy was taken away by Sir Howard. Her mother also found an angry Charlotte and blamed her for upsetting Sir Howard and tried to persuade her to sign a contract of sale. Money is a woman's only power in this world. Thank you, Ma, for all you've done. For Lucy and for me. You never, ever sold us short. The status of women was very low in the society of that time. The nobles lived a life of luxury with their estates, lands and hereditary titles. But women, without the right to inherit, had to work hard to get a good man to make ends meet. Lucy, a naive and unsophisticated girl, entered the society, but she still has a long way to go if she wants to become a successful prostitute like her sister Charlotte. The two brothels are in business competition. Lydia, who runs a high-end brothel, can't stand the sight of a rival madam, so she bribes the nuns to shut down Margaret's brothel. Margaret is fined a lot of money and fights back when she finds out what's going on. She finds a prostitute who's retired from a high-end brothel. Mary was already seriously ill. Margaret then paid off another writer to publicize Lydia's vicious behavior. I'm impressed by how good 18th century public relations is. As soon as the article was published, the high and mighty who patronized Lydia's brothels left in droves. The clientele of high-end brothels disappeared overnight. How? Seeing as we've got no coals. On the other hand, Lucy received an invitation to the Baron's far-flung estate. She was greeted by the Baron and his wife. After bathing and dressing, they took Lucy on a hunting trip. Lucy, who had never killed before, was terrified. In her unfamiliar surroundings, she is more like a frightened deer. 
Not knowing which gun is being aimed at her, Lucy's nervousness and inhibitions were obvious to the Baron. He teased Lucy that she wasn't as interesting as Charlotte, at which point Lucy found the courage to say, Every shot he made was wonky. I shall call him Lord Wonky. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy's joke had humiliated him, and the night would leave her traumatized. From then on, Lucy's every social interaction was a failure. Margaret thought that the beautiful, naive Lucy would soon be adored by the upper crust of the aristocracy. However, she withdrew when I touched her. My apologies, Mrs. Wells. I, I feel your daughter is not for me. Margaret was overwhelmed by her daughters in her business, and without business, her rival, Lydia, was ready to strike back. I'm oh, deliciously vulgar. The girls stood motionless in fancy dresses and skins whiter than snow, and adjusted to the perfect angle by the men. Suddenly, <laughs> Emily gets yelled at by Leah, the brothel owner, for not holding back a fart. Lydia was in the middle of an important business deal. Lydia had turned in a rival madam, Margaret, and was able to get away with it because she had good connections. The judge introduced Lydia to a new deal. I am in need of a girl. Take one. Not that kind of a girl. The judge asked her to find a clean girl for a nobleman who doesn't want to be seen. Lydia dressed up and went to the job market to target a naive out-of-town girl. I have a vacant position for the right maid. No wonder. Are you she? <laughs> Perhaps you are. Lydia successfully lied her way into the girl and took her to a room she'd rented in advance. She set everything up, closed the door and locked it. The girl became the prey of the aristocrat. Her mysterious disappearance would be her fate for the rest of her life. As the rumors about her brothel dissipated, Lydia began to revitalize her life. But at Margaret's brothel, that disease Mary eventually died. Margaret made a snap decision to organize a big funeral for her. They wanted to raise a voice for Mary's tragic fate and to promote their own image. This time they were confronted by a nun hired by Lydia, who cursed and insulted them. Mary The prostitutes sent Mary on her last journey with sons and smiles. They then took her body to the gates of the Golden Square whorehouse and once again provoked Lydia. Soon after, Margaret finally raised enough money to move into Soho with her prostitutes. But as soon as she entered, that stench hit her. Lydia had put Mary's body here. Margaret cleaned the floor over and over. But the stench wouldn't go away. Margaret had gotten acquainted with her new neighborhood. And this nun had been insulting her all day. So she planned a hell of a mass party to kick off her new career. How quickly did the jealous Duke change his attitude toward the harlot? He bit on Lucy, Charlotte's sister, yesterday to spite Charlotte, and the next day he's down on one knee begging for her forgiveness. I'm deranged with love. Don't leave me. I, I look a fool in front of the whole town. And when he made a scene, Charlotte gave him a pass. Sir Howard promised her a pearl and gold ring as compensation and pay Charlotte's entire debt. Sir Howard was quick to honor his promise before he finally got Charlotte to smile. Charlotte's flirting skills were superb. But it wasn't long before Sir Howard's wife started counting Charlotte's bills. She has spent this much already this year. She has spent that much already this month. <laughs> she didn't come to Charlotte to fight or curse, but to get on the same page with her. My husband is a man-child, a fop-doodle who's frittering away my fortune. It turns out Sir Howard's fortune was inherited from his wife's ancestors. Marriage is the worst kind of thief. She wanted to make an alliance with Charlotte to curb Sir Howard's profligacy. But Charlotte wasn't interested. She's a free spirit, and she's never been one for keeping people in line, not to mention the fact that she was the one who spent most of Sir Howard's money. Margaret told her daughter Charlotte about her idea for a mass ball. She wanted Charlotte to be the one to invite the dignitaries. Charlotte was still the most glamorous harlot of them all. Take Lucy with you. See if you can help her. Charlotte took her sister Lucy to the casino, to extend the invitation to the noblemen and gentlemen. To Hades. And all who dare to travel there. Soon the day of the party arrived. All the prostitutes were dressed up, masked and ready. Why don't I get a mask? <laughs> Not you. It's different with you. You must be seen. You know that. As the doors knocked, the masked ball was filled with people. Lucy watched the crowds as she made her way to the piano. My thing is my own and I keep it so Lucy was once again in the spotlight. Even the haughty Lord Fallon came to see her. 
Lord Famine said he would one day bring Lucy into his world. This harlot, dressed to the nines, decided to leave her crazy fan once and for all. Because Sir Howard not only possessed her, he also wanted to possess her sister. Lucy clearly refused to have sex, but it didn't stop. Lucy takes out a knife and accidentally stabs him. Sir Howard ran out to get help, but he called her mom, Margaret. Margaret immediately told Lucy to get out and held Sir Howard down. She warned him not to move or he would bleed profusely. She slowly calmed him down and ordered a doctor to be called immediately. When Sir Howard had calmed down a little, Margaret went out of the room and said that no one should know about this and that there was no need to get a doctor. Margaret went back into the room and crashed a rag to his wound and reassured him that a doctor would be here soon. She had to let Sir Howard die here today or Lucy would be charged and hanged for murder. Charlotte arrives when she learns of this. You are vile. Charlotte. I need you. All Margaret could think about was saving Lucy, but she didn't think that when Sir Howard died, Charlotte, his mistress, would be suspected of the murder. Margaret waited for him to bleed to death and then carried his body out in the dead of night. She dressed Sir Howard up and drove his carriage out into the countryside as if he were drunk. Then she dumped his body in the river, pretending to have been killed by robbers. The next day, when Sir Howard's body was found, Charlotte was considered the first suspect, but Sir Howard's recently widowed wife was willing to testify on her behalf. Who killed my husband? Villains, perhaps. Like they say. Whoever they are, I am free. With her testimony, Charlotte is cleared. But will Margaret, the real killer, escape justice? And that's the end of the first season of Harlots. It left a lot of unanswered questions and set the stage for the second season. They look like a romantic painting. A woman with a pale face and a pink wig walks down the stairs. She is Charlotte, the most glamorous harlot in all of London. In 18th century England, prostitutes were popular, and brothels of all kinds flourished. And there were wars between the women. Charlotte was debuted by her own mother, Margaret, when she was 16, but now she's joined her mother's nemesis, Lydia, and has become Golden Square's leading prostitute. The day the new judge arrived at Golden Square, Lydia immediately greeted him and told him there was a wide range of women's styles. In my house, a man's desires are met with unrestrained and willing grace. She then summoned a player to play a sport, but the new judge pulled out a note. Lydia, quickly, this is a warrant for your arrest as a keeper of a bawdy and disorderly house. Not only was Lydia not in a hurry, she left for a long time. Her brothel had flourished because of the old judge. But when the new judge takes office, he wants to enforce the law by having his men interrogate all the prostitutes and take Lydia to court. Charlotte immediately calms Lydia down and tells her not to worry. She will find a way to get Lydia out. But after Lydia was taken away, Charlotte smiled in satisfaction. I'll suck my old boots. There was an immediate outcry when the infamous Bob was brought into the courtroom. The new judge fined her 500 pounds based on the evidence. But her rival, Margaret, wasn't satisfied. The fine is not enough! Silence! This is a vile kidnapper! Margaret accused Lydia in court of secretly procuring innocent women for the rich and powerful and that she should be hanged. The judge, however, said that any accusation must be substantiated. Margaret's lack of proof failed to push Lydia into the abyss of hell. But 500 pounds was a lot of money for Lydia, and her brothel will be closed for a month. Before the fine could be paid, Lydia was put behind bars. When her son Charles found out she'd been arrested, he and his mistress Emily rushed to Golden Square to raid his mother's property, and threw a party every chance he got. Lydia had to take up crafts in prison, so she could bribe the guards to deliver a secret letter to the rich and famous people she'd been trading with underground. But Lord Fallon reads the letter and has no intention of saving her. I propose some sport and cutting out her tongue. The top bot is a prisoner, stripped of her makeup and emaciated. Lydia suffered the betrayal of everyone, but only the prostitute Charlotte came to visit. But Lydia remained calm. A woman's power is in her secrets. I've collected them like jewels, and now they'll keep me safe. Lady Fitz, Isabella Fitzwilliam, heiress of Blaine. After decades as a bard, her most valuable asset is her contacts. She asked Charlotte to find Isabella, the Blaine heiress. I could ruin her with one sentence. Charlotte followed the instructions and arrived at the mansion. Isabella, at this point, is showing her high society credentials who insults me by inviting this brazen strumpet into my home? Charlotte was not used to such insults. Instead, she took Isabella aside and made her intentions clear. My current benefactor, Mrs. Quigley, sends me in her hour of need. So that is it. How dare you come? 
it was clear that Lydia did have something that could destroy Isabella. Charlotte offered to pay her a fine of 500 pounds, even though Isabella had no liquidity and her entire fortune was in her brother's possession. She promised to pay Lydia because the secret was too horrible. If I broke free and spoke my heart, the sea would bubble, the sky would turn red and London would tumble into dust. Charlotte is unexpectedly attracted to her unique charms, but when Isabella's brother approaches, Isabella immediately ends the conversation and tells Charlotte to come in the morning to get the money. The next day, Charlotte arrived as promised. Isabella's brother placed the check on the table, stating that Isabella had said last night that the money was to pay off a gambling debt. But Marquis of Blaine didn't believe her, so he started pressing Charlotte. It took only a look for Charlotte to realize what she was trying to tell her. The money is to pay a debt. Oh, very good. Very good. What kind? Surely not hazard. Lady Isabella. What a pair of colluding pixies you are. Hmm? Isabella was impressed with Charlotte's understanding. Satisfied with her check, Charlotte went to court to pay the fine, ignoring interference from her mother, Margaret. Shame on you, Charlotte Wells. You will not disrespect this court. Shame on you too. When Lydia finally got out of prison and returned to Golden Square, she ran into her son, whom she hadn't seen in a long time. She was relieved to see that he was worried about her, until she saw the brothel in shambles. You have had a party. While I festered in a cesspit, you have laughed at my misfortune and prayed I would not return. Here is the child who came to my side. Here is my rightful heir. Lydia was so angry with her ungrateful son that she kicked him and Emily out of the house. Since her son was a failure, she had to revitalize her career on her own. But by now, the brothel was being guarded. She had to take the girls out on business. What is it like when three brothel owners get together? A cock in her mouth. <laughs> she gets her daughters to do it now. <laughs> Margaret couldn't stand it any longer and knocked Leah to the ground with a blow. Charlotte stepped in to stop her and pulled her mother aside. God's sake, oh, you ruin everything. It turns out that Charlotte approached Lydia under false pretenses in order to destroy her. Lydia not only doesn't know what Charlotte is up to, but she also wants to use Charlotte's trump card to climb up the social ladder to help her get back on her feet. Isabella, despite her arrogance, is surprised to find Charlotte a good match. Except for Lydia, who disgusts her. She is poison. You are nectar. I will not have her anywhere near my circle. Only you. Charlotte was invited to a fireworks dinner. She was presented with a pink rose by one of the attendants. Charlotte searched for the giver and finally landed on the woman across the river, also holding a rose. But Isabella's friendship with Charlotte seems to have made Isabella's brother jealous. Isabella deliberately avoids her brother, brings Charlotte inside and confesses her true intentions. I want to destroy Lydia quickly. So do I. Then we'll be allies. From this moment on, Two women of ambition and desire are on the same side. As an ally, Isabella reminds Charlotte to stay away from her brother, Marquis of Blaine. Charlotte agrees, but the next moment Marquis of Blaine offers Charlotte 50 guineas for her services. Charlotte was concerned about Isabella's advice. My father was undersold, sir. A night here with me cannot be bought for less than 100 guineas. Well, the greater the cost, the greater the anticipation. Marquis of Blaine quickly agreed to pay her exorbitant price. Charlotte could not refuse him in front of Lydia. The next morning, Marquis of Blaine returned home and told Isabella about last night's work. She turned pale and went straight to Charlotte. The horse slowly dropped her luscious lips on her burning cheeks. Is there anything else you want? You've already paid. I'm... Isabella came to the brothel after learning that Charlotte, the harlot, had reneged on her promise to spend the night with Isabella's brother. She distracts the madam with a diamond earring. You promised. Oh, I should have known. A harlot can always be bought. My body, yes, but not my mind. Charlotte is adamant that she will stand with Isabella against Lydia and her brother Blaine. Impressed by Charlotte's sincerity, Isabella decided to reorganize her plan. She invited Lydia and Charlotte to a poker game. Lydia wanted to use Isabella's power to make connections in the upper echelon of society so that her brothel could function on the backs of the rich and powerful. But Isabella introduced Lydia to the Lord Chancellor as one of London's leading pimps. Lydia turned pale when she saw the Lord Chancellor here. Now that she's been pastored by a petty judge, won't the Lord Chancellor hand her 
Lydia warns Isabella that she still holds her secrets. And perhaps I shall tire of keeping the secret of your bastard child. Isabella is no longer afraid because she can't take being pushed around anymore. She'll go down with her if she has to reveal her secret. That's when Blaine started the fight and pushed all the winnings in front of Charlotte. All that to have you right now. Shall my dear Rose? Blaine pulled her roughly. Lydia was delighted to see that Charlotte had successfully seduced the Marquis of Blaine. Lord Chancellor approached her for a chat. Lydia, being a good judge of character, realized that the Lord Chancellor wasn't as serious as she'd thought. So she invited him to come and visit her beauty shelter. She chose the second best peach girl after Charlotte to introduce the Lord Chancellor. But he wasn't impressed. I mean no offense to Miss Pettifer, but I see no woman in this room who is superior to you, Mrs. Quigley. Uh -oh. I prefer a riper fruit. <laughs> Lydia, in her old age, couldn't resist Lord Chancellor's pleas to return to her old ways. The young judge nearly burned his eyes out when he entered the room on a tip. His boss told him to get lost, so Lydia had a get out of jail free card. She wrote him so often, she looked better. Lydia began planning her anniversary celebration. Her rival, Margaret, was unhappy that Lydia was about to make a comeback. But it was good to know that her daughter Charlotte was on her side. Now you find a spark. And I'll light it and we'll burn her to the ground. The horse spread her arms wide and scorned everything with her flirtatious eyes. She puts a dark red, juicy cherry between her soft red lips. In this role-playing themed event, Charlotte, the prostitute, played the role of the goddess Veritas. But the real climax of Lydia's plan was the sacrifice of a pure and innocent maiden. Her virginity was to be auctioned off in secret by the rich and powerful. Charlotte has been lurking in a rival brothel for a long time, waiting for Lydia to commit another crime. Charlotte offered to go with her in order to get evidence of Lydia's abduction of an innocent girl. To what purpose? To learn to be like her. The bot was very pleased to see her child so motivated, so she took her to the job market. First, she targeted a pretty girl to find out her family background then solved the girl's problems with a decent job. After gaining her trust, they asked her if she'd ever been in love. Thus determining whether the girl is a virgin or not, she indicates that she has passed the interview and takes her home to discuss the details of the job. Once the girl had gratefully drunk a cup of spiked hot tea, she was unconscious and at their mercy. Charlotte witnessed the entire process of abducting the girl in order to bring Lydia to justice. Charlotte took all of her savings to Isabella to devise a plan. They planned to find someone to bid on the girl as a witness to Lydia's crimes. You trust me to do this, Abigail? That's the girl's name. The sweet thing. Untarnished by our world. I hope it stay that way. Isabella had no cash, so she put up her necklace as collateral. With no one she could trust, she synchronized her plan with Margaret. Soon the night of the auction for the anniversary of Lydia's brothel arrived. Charlotte was a little nervous as the plan began to unfold. It was only the arrival of William, posing as a nobleman, that brought her relief. She whispered to Lydia that William was very rich and set the stage for the auction. With all the well-dressed gentlemen looking on, the virgin auction began. To Charlotte's surprise, the debonair and arrogant Blaine was also interested in the girl. Fresh fruit cleanses the palate. Blaine's generous bidding has sent the price of the girl skyrocketing, and it's about to overtake William's entire fortune. Charlotte rushed to stop Blaine. You can't have her. I want you. It's hard to resist the charms of a top whore. At Charlotte's urging, Blaine stopped bidding, but her antics were seen by Lydia. William eventually won the girl for 200 pounds, but when it came time to pay, Isabella's necklace gave way. Blaine recognizes it as his sister's. William lead and said he won it at a card game. Charlotte rushed to testify that she was there, but when Lydia asked what the owner of the necklace looked like, William couldn't answer. Their life finally caught up with Lydia. So Lydia handed the girl over to Blaine, the second highest bidder and locked Charlotte in her room for lying. But while Charlotte and Margaret were doing their best to fight Lydia and the forces behind her, Lucy was up to her usual foolishness. The woman steers the carriage with grips on the ropes and raises the price of sleeping with her. Five hundred a year. The man enjoys agreeing to her demands. Lucy gloated over the success of her negotiations, not realizing that she had fallen into Lord Fallon's trap. Lucy left the squalor of the brothel and moved into Fallon's luxurious estate. When she is ready, Lord fell in place hard to get. Lucy's tricks included showing off her handiwork in a cramped, darkened carriage, or showing off her sexy body in front of the servants. 
You said you'd treat me as your wife. But I'm not your wife. I'm your whore. But Fallon stuck to his rhythm and played aristocratic fencing with Lucy, an ambitious game of attack and play that finally aroused his desire for conquest. He played the purely monetary relationship in a way that completely bewildered the ignorant Lucy. To further mesmerize Lucy, Lord Fallon showed her his treasured assets. These are all daggers from the Spartans. He worships the Spartans, a noble race that kills the lesser races as a rite of passage. He even wanted Lucy to admit that it, too, was a Spartan. At that moment, Lucy is a love brain. She reveals the secret she's been hiding for the first season. Fueled by the smoke. The same as you. You've killed. With one stab. Lord Fallon soon figured out that Lucy had killed her sister's former master. And Lucy's exposure is about to send her mother to the gallows. Still in the throes of a sweet relationship, Lucy came to Golden Square to find her sister Charlotte. Lydia threatened Charlotte to obey her and not leave her alone with her sister. Love struck Lucy doesn't notice anything strange till Fallon picks her up. That's when an informant tells Charlotte that he saw Lord Fallon kill the former judge. Charlotte rushed him to report it to Margaret, but their conversation was overheard and soon told to Lydia and Fallon. So Fallon sent Lucy home first. He lied about going to the bank, but he was actually going to kill someone. But in the chaos, Fallon stabbed the little nun who was blocking the knife. The informant told Margaret the truth. It was only then that Margaret realized her youngest daughter, Lucy, had been caught in the crossfire. She tried to warn Lucy, but she ran into Lucy making out with Fallon. Damn you, Ma! Get out! Margaret wanted to talk to her daughter alone and tell her how dangerous Lord Fallon was. But Lucy said that she and Lord Fallon were family. That there was no need for secrets. Margaret had no choice but to point out that Lord Fallon had just stabbed a nun in the street in order to kill someone. Lucy, instead of being convinced, thought Margaret was being ridiculous. I cannot say it any clearer. This man is a killer. So am I. What have you told him? Lucy and I are in perfect harmony. And put her up. While the woman is undressed, her brother unashamedly enters and places an amethyst necklace around her neck. I won them in a bidding war, along with first use of a virgin. Her brother's outrageous behavior instantly reminds Isabella of the assault she suffered as a child. Your damn hands off me. I will leave you forever. It turns out that this is the secret Isabella keeps. The one thing that makes her vulnerable to Lydia. When she was young, she gave birth to a daughter. And with Lydia's help, she hid it from everyone. Isabella secretly sent her daughter to boarding school. But this illegitimate daughter's origins are even more outrageous. When I was very young, he damned me with his lust. My child she is his. He doesn't know. You are not damned. Isabella reveals her vulnerability to Charlotte. Their trust in each other goes beyond simple friendship. Charlotte's gentle touch finally made Isabella less resistant to intimacy. However, last night's bidding night revealed an amethyst necklace that would have thrown a wrench into Charlotte and Isabella's plans. When confronted by Lydia, Charlotte didn't pretend to be a good girl. She dropped Lydia onto her back and grabbed her by the throat. Do you feel wrong? You stink of fiber and death. And I hate, I hate you. Charlotte regretted not being able to stop Lydia from helping a gang of aristocrats violate innocent girls. Just as Lydia was about to be strangled, Margaret arrived just in time to prevent her daughter from destroying herself. It was the moment when mother and daughter finally came together. Margaret felt guilty seeing her daughter take such a risk. She regretted involving Charlotte in their previous generation's feud. But Charlotte also learned it from her undercover work how Lydia had dragged her mother into the mire and ruined her life. And I did as much to you. I'm sorry. It was the moment when mother and daughter finally revealed their feelings and embraced. Margaret brought Charlotte home. Lucy returned. The Wells family was finally reunited. But at this point, Lucy was trying to avoid her mother's eyes thinking that Lucy had revealed her murderous secret to Fallon. Margaret decided to take the fall for her youngest daughter. She came to the young judge's house and confessed to Sir Howard's murder. She took the blame for Lucy's first stabbing and her husband's dumping of the body. Then she named Fallon as the man who stabbed the little nun in the street and killed the former justice. All she has to do is wait until the little nun wakes up to prove it. And then, if Lord Fallon says Lucy killed Sir Howard, Margaret, who'd already confessed, could prove Fallon was lying. It was then that the judge realized Margaret's intentions behind her confession. But at this point, Lucy is still obsessed with the idea that Lord Fallon is a good man. He could protect us both. He could protect this whole house. You should be loyal to him. Charlotte thought her sister was hopelessly stupid, but Lucy not only didn't listen to her advice, but also sneaked back to Fallon's house when everyone wasn't looking. 
the lovesick Lucy was hopeless. These past days have been heaven. You speak as though they are over. Margaret was on the verge of being sent to the gallows for taking all the blame for her daughter. On the other hand, Lucy chose to believe that Lord Fallon didn't kill anyone and testified for him. Lydia said that Lord Fallon and Lucy left and returned home together on the day of the murder. Can you confirm this? Yes. You both boarded the carriage and journeyed straight home without diversion? We did. Lord Fallon was acquitted with the help of stupid Lucy. And beknownst to her, her mother was shivering in a dungeon, awaiting her death sentence. That's when Charlotte brought Isabella to the Chancellor. She began by using Isabella's nobility to plead that Margaret had defended her daughter against her insults. But the Lord Chancellor was unmoved. So Charlotte had to use Lord Chancellor's sordid affair with Lydia as blackmail, and that started to make the Chancellor a little shaky. But then Lydia came in with an additional twist. She has already told Isabella's brother about Isabella's illegitimate daughter. Isabella will soon be institutionalized, and by executing Margaret as soon as possible, it'll make Charlotte into a murderous daughter as well. And then no one would believe either of their testimonies. As an old rival, Lydia came to the prison to see Margaret off. In fact, Lydia really liked Charlotte. She wanted Margaret to let her daughter follow her. She won't. I thought my hatred burnt hot. But next to hers, mine is tepid. Lydia was disappointed that she couldn't win Charlotte over. Then the young judge brought in the verdict. Margaret was to be hanged, and Lord Fallon acquitted on Lucy's perjury. No! 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 In the end, Margaret removed her belongings and left them. One for her son and one for her youngest daughter, Lucy. Nothing for Charlotte. Charlotte is my heir. I'm sorry. It's time. Margaret made her way down the long corridor to the gallows. A notice of her death was posted outside the courthouse. Everyone was instantly plunged into mourning, but it was only when the not-so-smart Lucy came to her senses and found blood on Fallon's sleeve that she realized she'd done something stupid. Lucy was about to go to the judge to retract her confession when she learned that her mother had been hanged trying to save her. It was her stupid ignorance that sent her mother to the gallows. She fell to her knees and wept in despair. She wanted to cut the man who had deceived her to pieces. But the man who had deceived her came to her house. Lucy grabs a dagger and aims it at the tied-up man. The man tried to win her sympathy at the end of his life. <laughs> I didn't mean to use you. What I feel for you is true. <laughs> when the little nun who was stabbed in the street wakes up, the criminal nobility is about to be exposed, and Fallon will be the first to be blamed for the murder. Blaine asked Fallon to fill in the loophole, so Fallon sneaks into the little nun's room and tries to kill her again but the sound of a struggle attracts the maid. She knocked Fallon to the ground from behind. They tied Fallon up. The nun's mother was the first to take it out on him, so she cut Fallon's cheek. Then Lucy stepped forward and put a knife to his throat. Make him square, Lucy. Lucy hated the thought of being fooled and lied to, and she wanted to cut him to pieces, but Charlotte needed to get more names out of him. Tell us what you know, or I'll release this avenging angel. Stop your fucking arm! Fallon finally got scared and confessed that Blaine was behind their crimes and that Lydia was supplying them with innocent girls. With a confession in hand, they tied Fallon up in a secret place, waiting for a chance to bring these criminals down in one fell swoop. Charlotte told Isabella about the heinous crimes her brother had committed. When her brother Blaine crumbles, Isabella will be completely free. But then Isabella's illegitimate daughter was brought to Blaine by Lydia. In order to save her daughter from her brother, Isabella eventually traded Lord Fallon's whereabouts for her daughter and her fortune. The nobles banded together to rescue Lord Fallon and decided to punish him within the organization. They made Lord Fallon sign a confession to all of his crimes and then commit Harakiri in front of everyone. The nobles' crimes were eventually covered up. It wasn't until Fallon disappeared that Charlotte realized it was all due to Isabella's betrayal. I feel cursed, Nancy. But they still have to deal with Lydia. They can testify against Lydia if they find the abducted girl. But the girl was accidentally released by Lydia's son. By the time Charlotte arrives at the brothel, Lydia's son has learned of his mother's abduction of the girl. Charlotte went on to list all of Lydia's crimes. Charles couldn't stand it any longer and locked his mother in her room, but he couldn't bear the thought of his mother being sent to the gallows. Charlotte then had an idea. There was another way to control everything. A moment later, Charles opened the door. Lydia thought her son had come to his senses, but then two men forcibly dragged her away. Charles signed her mom into an insane asylum.
everything seems to have settled down. But the husband, who had been busy looking for Margaret's body for the past two days, had no luck. He couldn't stand it any longer, so he went to the young judge, who was drinking, and he finally demanded the truth with his fists. You cannot bury her, because she is not dead. It turned out that on the day of the execution, the judge had had mercy. He bribed the executioner to put Margaret on a freighter to South Africa and banished her instead of hanging her. When the family found out that Margaret was still alive, hope was restored. The bloodshed was over for a while, but the undercurrents in London did not stop there. Charlotte has taken up her mother's mantle and is ready to take on her own challenges. London's best horse shows up at the door of a tavern dressed as a man, wearing a wig and riding a white horse. A strip auction that will make men's blood pumping has begun. Lucy, the whore who's made so many men swoon, is the prize of today's auction. I bid five guineas. A man is the first to bid 5,000 guineas for the fragrant coat, and another man bids 10,000 guineas for her shirt. In the heat of the auction, in no time at all, the sexy woman is left with only a corset. All the men were horny as hell, keeping the price up, but she knows how to flirt, leaving a beautiful backside to make the men even more eager. Lucy, a bit of a looker, inherited her sister Charlotte's title as London's number one whore. Men filled the London squares. I've given you my whole month's allowance, and I insist. You'll have to catch me first. <laughs> Her sister Charlotte has officially retired from prostitution and inherited her mother's brothel to become the most gorgeous male. Instead of taking clients, Charlotte spends the rest of her time with Isabella. Isabella even held a salon to introduce Charlotte to celebrities and noble women and to attract money to help her brothel. But all the ladies wanted to know was whether Charlotte had received their husbands. I'm bored now. I run a house. There's hardly a man in my bed. Charlotte said that her brothel would provide shelter and work for homeless girls. They've been ruined by poverty, not by Miss Wells. But the celebrities were clearly unimpressed and looked down on her. They are not on speaking terms. Charlotte had no choice but to wave her hands and leave. Isabella wanted to help Charlotte get the upper class to let go of their prejudices. But it's clear that it can't be done in a day. Even Isabella, who is a member of high society, is plagued by rumors and prejudice. The single lady of high society has been rumored to have an illegitimate daughter. She was not only despised, but banished from the aristocracy. But I'm sure you'll understand. I have my wife's moral welfare to think about. Sophia, let us go. Rumors of an illegitimate daughter appeared in the tabloid press, claiming that Sophia was born to Isabella and a servant. Isabella was reluctant to tell her daughter who the father was because it was her brother who had violated her. But Sophia believed the rumors in the press. I believe the story is true. My father's a servant and you are ashamed. Isabella is concerned about her daughter's belief in the rumors. She's afraid the rumors will destroy her reputation and her relationship with her daughter. She wanted to talk to Charlotte, but Charlotte was too busy with her business and Nancy was the only one who offered her a solution. You have health, fortune, child who loves you. Your reputation is a burden. I have none and I'm free as a crow. Nancy told Isabella to face the scandal head on. It wasn't her fault. Women shouldn't be burdened with men's definitions of chastity. So Isabella went to the gentleman's club to find the baron who had expelled her this morning. I have a daughter born out of wedlock. If that's a scandal, then I own it. For her love is my greatest blessing. Isabella hoped that what she said tonight would be in the morning papers because they don't bow down to the condemnation of gossip. This is unfitting. I strongly suggest you leave. Looking at the pig whore in the Baron's arms, Isabella couldn't help but mock him. I see your wife's moral welfare is ever in your thoughts. A man on the prowl for pleasure has no regard for his wife's honor. Decency and honor are just rules set for women in men's systems. And this group of free-spirited women is the beginning of breaking those rules. Isabella had always protected her daughter for fear of harm, but that was too much for her daughter. Who wanted to be free? And yet she hides me away and treats me like a child. Would you be daring to? Sophia did what the rumor has it her mother did, left a letter and ran away with the servant. Isabella, though she feared for her daughter's safety, was glad she was brave enough to pursue her freedom. Even Charlotte's eyes were filled with envy. She's in love. She's rich beyond all our dreams. The gorgeous Charlotte has been upgraded from a high-end whore to a bug. Yet men still sought her out and were willing to be her captives. Charlotte didn't want to work for it, but he insisted he was better than everyone else. You mouth for your manhood. 
Which one's bigger? He's a shameless man who makes his money by sweet talking and flirting. His pickup lines gradually got Charlotte hooked. She hadn't slept with a man for a long time, but she agreed to have sex. But afterward, the man showed his true colors. Isaac owns a tavern with his brother on the next street. He offered to work with Charlotte to help her promote her girls in his tavern, but he wanted a quarter of the profits. Charlotte was instantly disappointed to learn that it was a shameless pimp who had come to ask for food. She gets dressed and informs the girls outside that they're being played. But the men in the room were all Isaac's men. The prostitutes were no match for them. Charlotte was also being held in a chokehold. For the safety of the girls, Charlotte agreed to Isaac's terms. Isaac returned to the tavern, proudly bragging to his brother about what he had done today. I had Charlotte Wells and, and our Rector. At this point, Isaac was still gloating, but Charlotte would soon show him he messed with the wrong man. The next day, Charlotte arrived at the tavern with her girls and warned Isaac to remove his men from her brothel, but he refused to do so. Charlotte had to let the sheriff in. That's a public act of lewdness. This is a bawdy and disorderly house. Who's the tavern keeper here? This man. Charlotte smiled in triumph as she watched the strutting man being arrested. Since the sheriff was a regular customer of Charlotte's, he had to protect her business. In the end, Isaac's brother had to pay a 20 pound fine to get Isaac out of jail. And Charlotte joined all the bods in London at the tavern to put an end to Isaac's business. They exposed Isaac's deception and made him stop trying to collect protection money from the pimps. And that's not all. Charlotte humiliated Isaac by taunting him about his poor sexual skills. Charlotte took the girls out for a drink to celebrate her victory. But the sore loser was up to no good. He threw a lip bottle into the room and set Charlotte's brothel on fire. On his way back, he ran into Charlotte and with a shred of conscience, he warned her. Fly away home. When Charlotte returned, the brothel was filled with smoke. Luckily, the girls and their children were all safe and sound. Charlotte was determined to make the arsonist pay when she saw the devastation and loss of property, but with no evidence or witnesses. Even if Charlotte knew Isaac had started the fire, the sheriff couldn't arrest him with no legal recourse. Charlotte decided to make Isaac pay in her own way. He's with me. <laughs> A band of vengeful sisters was formed after Isaac's brother left the house. Cherry, the informant, told them to get started. Lucy was the first to be dispatched on a white horse to the tavern door to auction off her clothes. She caught the eye of the men who came to take their pleasure. Charlotte caught her sister's eye and slipped into the tavern towards Isaac, but this time she wasn't looking for a fight. Instead, she flirted with Isaac and took him upstairs to find a bed. When the time was right, a second group of prostitutes moved in. One pestered the guards at the door. Nancy slipped into the basement to look for money. Just as Isaac's brother Hal was on his way back to the tavern, in an attempt to buy time, Lucy yelled out how much Hal was willing to pay to auction off her personal effects. Finally, after nearly 30 minutes, Nancy found the money. She whistled to signal Charlotte that everything was done. Charlotte was about to leave, but Isaac took her into his arms and apologized for setting the fire. I'm sorry. Me too. Then one by one, the prostitutes left the tavern. Lucy, meanwhile, left her beautiful back in front of the man. Once again, Charlotte won the game by a wide margin. The theft of all the money angered the two brothers who ran the tavern. I could tear Charlotte Wells's heart from her chest. So you fucked her. Seems more like she fucked you. Woman tied to bed with leather straps, the doctor spreads her legs and then reaches into her private place to help her release her pressure and desire. The woman struggles, but nothing changes. The well-dressed professor claims it's his original psychiatric treatment, but it's really for his own personal gratification. Kate's stepfather signed her into an insane asylum after he caught her riding her childhood friend in the stables. They did it to curb her desires and locked up in the same room as her was Lydia, the former madam who controlled everything in the world of prostitution. And the asylum's customized treatment for Lydia was to strap her to a spinning chair for two hours at high speed to induce vertigo and to activate her defective nerves by provoking the unconscious excretion of every hole in her body. Lydia was signed into an insane asylum by her own son and suffered this brutal torture every day. But when Lydia sees the beautiful face of her new roommate, Kate, she has an occupational hazard. When she learns why Kate's been locked up, she finds a ray of hope. I am fallen. Oh, Angel, you are bright still. The helpless, desperate Kate gave Lydia hope that she could make a comeback. She's a expert at brainwashing people, and she's trying to brainwash Kate. Because out there is a city where your future awaits. I tell you, for true, you could have London wrapped around your fingers like a dazzling string of pearls. Alas, you 
Oh, Kay was tortured by doctors, who took her away for two hours every day. So all she could do was talk to her only roommate, Lydia. He took care to leave no mark as he stuffed his fat fingers inside me and named it his most modern physic. Lydia sympathized with Kate's plight, so she started making plans to escape in order to save Kate and help herself get back on her feet. He must use his weakness. His rod will be his ruin. And then the day came when they finally got their chance. The professor was going to take Lydia to the therapy and show her to the guests. Kate suddenly stopped the professor and told him that her body was very hot and needed to be treated right away. The professor was more than happy to help, but the guests waiting outside put him in a quandary. Lydia helps out by saying she'll help distract them until he's finished. So the professor agreed, but Lydia turned around and told the visiting doctors and guests that the professor was using a new treatment on Kate. Then she took them on a tour of the procedure. Here, the professor was committing atrocious acts of cruelty. Kate steals the key from him as she fights through the pain. And when the doctors and guests arrived, they were greeted with this gruesome sight. The situation was in chaos. Lydia and Kate took the opportunity to escape from the consulting room and lock everyone inside with a key. Then they opened the doors to all the wards and released all the patients, whether they were crazy or not. And so the two of them escaped the asylum and went on to a new life of freedom. The woman looked up at the sky and took a deep breath, savoring the sweetness of the moment. Talk with me. I think it's best alone. I'm not your chat, mate. Don't spoil it. Since Charlotte's complete confrontation with Isaac and his brother, she'd asked Isaac to a picnic in the park from time to time for the excitement of it all. But the two families were still at loggerheads. To avoid suspicion, Charlotte and Isaac never went to the park at the same time. Even when they did meet, they only brushed against each other to get a whiff of each other's scent. After her flirtation with Isaac, Charlotte returns to Isabella's arms. The true friendship between the two women is still unbreakable. After their last loss, the Isaac brothers turn their attention to real estate. They learn it of a promising plot of land for sale in the United States. The seller had just arrived in London two days earlier. The brothers immediately went to visit. The American landowner not only has an attractive piece of land, but also a very important wife, Margaret, who was hanged in season two, has finally returned. Though Margaret was eventually exiled, she's a seasoned lover and has managed to seduce a gentleman who's willing to do anything for her. The once overbearing butt is now drinking tea and embroidering flowers. Hal asks Emily to get close to the lady of the house in order to buy the land. Instead, we're treated to a reunion between the prostitute and her ex bud Emily is on the verge of screaming her head off. Margaret, with a plum, called her outside to catch up on old times. Were you here? You were hanged. I've got a slippery neck. Margaret advised her to mind her own business and keep her mouth shut. That way, Margaret could make sure the deal went through. Emily just wanted to make money and get on with her career, so she agreed to keep quiet. The land deal was finalized. Margaret finally found the time to return to the place where she'd fought so hard. The Wells family, who had been separated from each other, were finally reunited. Margaret told the story of her year in exile. She was doing well with her American husband. Margaret was relieved to know that her daughters had taken down Lydia and continued to build on her family's legacy. What clever girls. My handsome boys. But Margaret, by rights, should have been executed, so she had no place in London. She came back to take her family away with her and her American husband, but William said that he and his son would probably end up in slavery if they went to America. His words brought the discussion to a standstill. Margaret, on the other hand, said she would discuss these matters later. She couldn't stay here much longer now. She had to go back to her other home. But later that night, Margaret met with her best friend, Nancy, and learned it of her daughter's feud with Isaac's brother. She was on the verge of selling her land to an arsonist, so Margaret had to stop the deal from going through. Meanwhile, everyone is at Isabella's estate to watch a huge boxing match. The noble lady of high society walks down the stairs with a charming bod and enters the stage hand in hand with everyone watching and applauding. They've decided to make their love affair public tonight. Bravo! Bravo! Charlotte and Isabella's bravery has earned them the respect of all. But the boxing match in Charlotte's honor had an unexpected visitor. Her enemies, the Isaac brothers, have brought their newfound American landlord to join in the fun. Charlotte fakes a fight with Isaac to cover up her secret affair with him. The boxers are practically family. So if you don't want your pretty little face messed up, you'll behave like a lamb. <laughs> when the boxing match began, 
The fighters in the ring were in a frenzy. Charlotte and Isaac are watching each other passionately. Margaret arrives at the estate to prevent the sale of the land from being signed. But Margaret was caught in the crossfire between her American and London husbands. It turns out the landowner's interest was piqued by the intense boxing match. William, the match manager, warmly introduced his fighters and hoped he'd bet more. Here the two men are chatting enthusiastically. But Margaret, who was not far away, was very anxious. She asked Charlotte to call her American husband over. Charlotte then realized that it was her new stepfather standing next to her stepfather. She called the American landlord to the side as requested, but the sensitive Hal saw this and thought Charlotte was going to ruin his business. So he immediately sent his brother Isaac to eliminate Charlotte. And that's exactly what Isaac wanted. Isaac grabbed Charlotte and took her upstairs. At this point, the landowner, who was already in communication with Margaret, approached Hal in a rage. But I don't do business with arsonists. Take a look at yourself before venturing into the marketplace again. Having lost a big deal, Hal decided that Charlotte was behind the deal, so he angrily rushed upstairs and pulled Isaac and Charlotte apart as they made out. But when Hal pulled too hard, Charlotte fell down the stairs. When Kate and Lydia heard the noise, Hal ran off with his brother, and that was the end of Charlotte, a harlot in the prime of her life. Charlotte's death left everyone in a state of overwhelming grief. Charlotte was the most decent person I ever met. Those who loved her say, those who fought her battles of wits and courage. I loved her. Cursed her. Now I'm bereft. Charlotte's death is regretted by all. This brave and courageous woman, who dared to love and hate was the envy of all. Despite her irrevocable origins, this bright rose with thorns will not wither, but will bloom again, nourished by freedom.